what I've been taught and what we've been taught is you go out and you find what makes you happy and you chase that with everything you are, right? The American dream. But what we aren't taught is how to truly heal. And not just that, but we aren't taught that healing has to be the foundation for joy. So that's why we started the year with healing. Today we're gonna to talk about joy. And we're gonna talk about what, what joy actually is, what the word, what the Bible says joy actually is, rather than our preconceived notions of joy. So in the book of Nehemiah, for those of us that are familiar, there's a really powerful statement that he makes under a, a great deal of duress. There, his, the whole city of Jerusalem is, is being threatened with devastation as they rebuild the walls. Nehemiah is leading the charge to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And there are armies making threats and they're saying, hey, we're gonna level this place. And we find in this really pivotal moment in, in the book of Nehemiah, he's, uh, he's rallying the people around him and, and, and he makes this powerful statement. He says, the joy of the Lord is our strength. So he makes that statement in the middle of a really chaotic, potentially chaotic time and in the middle of um, it's not a good time, <laughs> you know, they're not having fun. But he says, the joy of the Lord is our strength. In the New Covenant, we hear Jesus speaking to his followers like this. He says, I came that they would know my joy and that their joy would be made complete, lacking nothing. So what does that even mean? I guess what Nehemiah is saying in, in that passage is, is he's saying, uh, that's okay, the world's on fire all around us, but all we have to do is smile. Is Jesus saying, uh, I came that they would know how to throw a party and that their party would be made complete? I don't think that's the case, but I think that's what we're taught in regards to joy. I think what we'll find is that the scriptures provide a definition of joy that's much more robust and, and much more, uh, it carries a lot more depth. We'll find that joy means to belong. Joy means to be connected deeply with someone. I mean, so the secular world agrees with this statement. When you, when you, uh, when you hear about people that study our brains, people much more intelligent than myself, they've come to the conclusion that joy is a sense of belonging and togetherness. So when you, when you, when you walk, in, walk into a room and you see a friend, you see someone that you really love, you see a family member that you really love, and your eyes meet, and you get excited, you go, hey, you know, like, what happens in that moment? is there, there, are, there, are, there are physiological changes that are happening within our brain where we see someone, we get really fired up to see them and they see that, that change on our countenance and then that fires them up. And, and what happens in milliseconds is we build, from a, a scientific viewpoint, we build joy rapidly. But that comes from this place of, of, of belonging to someone and then seeing it on their face. Remember that, that, that statement about looking on someone's face. So let's, let's go to the scriptures and let's, let's find out, find out how joy becomes strength through belonging or through being part of something. In, in Exodus chapter 17, we, we see uh, Moses, a uh, great leader of the people of Israel, led them out of Egypt and led them to the promised land, right? We see Moses on a hill and what the Lord had commanded him was they were, the people of Israel were coming into a battle and the opposing army waits for them. And, and as they approach, the Lord says, uh, what you are to do is you're to sit up on this hill and you watch over the battle, and you place your hands in the air, you lift your hands up. And as long as your hands are in the air, the battle will belong to Israel. But if your hands fall, 
Israel, Israel will fall. That's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of, that's, that's a lot of uh, um, weight and responsibility for one, one man. So the, the, the battle's playing out, Moses' hands are up, and Israel is winning the battle. What happens is he be, begins to become tired, and his hands start slipping. They droop a little bit. He's watching the battle start to turn, and Israel begins to be defeated and pushed back. His hands are falling. Now, his heart posture right there isn't going to be one that's smiling or partying, you know? He's watching this, this potentially horrific disaster unfolding before him, and he, and he can't even keep his hands up. Imagine how defeating that would be. Shame, you know, anger. His hands are falling. But what we see here is we see Aaron, Moses' brother, the high priest of the Lord, so a man that Moses loves and trusts, and a man the Lord loves and trusts. He comes alongside Moses, and then a man named uh, Her, another man that is set apart by the Lord that, that, that obviously Moses loves and trusts. What those two men do is they kick Moses' hands up so they, they remain upright. We watch, we watch the battle unfold. Israel wins the victory. Matthew chapter, uh, chapter 26. I couldn't see the chapter very well. Start, Matthew 26, starting in verse 36, we see a similar scenario play out with Jesus. See, he's, it, for context, he is just wrapped up his Passover dinner with those that he loves. Funny enough, Passover is in reference to Moses leading people out. So the connection is pretty interesting. Just wrapping up this dinner where Jesus pours his heart out to his people, those closest to him. He washes their feet and he shows them what it means to, to carry true authority, right? But then he says, the time has come for me to be delivered into the hands of the enemy. And, and they don't know how to receive that. So this, this moment of really high, the party, you know, really high happiness, they're singing songs, they're praising together, eating, like it's this really beautiful time. And then Jesus hits them with that. Time's come. So they withdraw to a garden to pray. That's where we pick up here. In verse 36, it says this, Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. Before I go further, I just want to point out the name Gethsemane means olive press. So just right out of the gate with this passage, it just indicates how much pressure Jesus was under. It says some accounts say that he sweat, began to sweat drops of blood. The olive press, it presses down and it squeezes out drops of olive oil, priceless. During this time and culture, it was a priceless commodity being crushed so that it would produce this, this, this uh, uh, olive oil. But Jesus goes out and he's being crushed by the weight of, of, of every sin that would be <laughs> committed, every word spoken against him. He's carrying it all and he's about to be crushed physically. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he told the disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. It sounds like he's going somewhere by himself, right? The very following verse says this, taking along Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. The two sons of Zebedee were James and John. And these three, if we look at the gospel accounts, we'll see Peter, James, and John were with Jesus all the time. They were his trusted men. He began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. So they had this party together and it wasn't sorrow or distress, it was joy and remembrance of liberation and freedom. Now they're, they are, they are, they're sitting in heaviness. Then he said to them, my soul is swallowed up in sorrow to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake with me. 
He's pleading with his close ones, I need you, is what he's saying. Going a little further, he fell face down and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Was it the fact that he had his dear ones close, that he had the strength to confess that, yet not as I will, but you will? Could that be true? You see the similarities between Moses and Jesus here. The future of the kingdom depending on this one moment, everything hinging on this one moment. And what happens with Moses, he, he's failing, his strength is failing. And he needs people that he loves to come alongside him and trusts to come alongside him. People that knew him intimately. Jesus says, I am, my soul is swallowed up in sorrow to the point of death. He is, like, he is God with skin on. But he, the, the word says that he made himself obedient to death. So he made, like, everything, he was like us in every way but in sin. So that means he felt, he felt pressure and fear and distress and anguish to the point of death. He needed his close ones around him. So what does joy mean? Is joy being happy? We see right here that Jesus was deeply distressed to the point of death, but he needed to belong. He needed, he needed to teach us what it meant to belong. He, we know that Jesus also said that all of Scripture is held up by two things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. He's speaking covenant languages. He's exemplifying that here. He, he, is, he, is, he is placing his trust in those dear to him and asking us to do the same.